Sisters worried because they can't get hold of their mum, one of them, Sophia Newton. The police arrived and we followed them upstairs and then they turned round to the top of the stairs and said that she was there and we had to go out because it was um, a crime scene. What has happened? The Newtons appear a picture-perfect family. As far as anybody would be able to tell, a really normal, tight-knit family. But as police and paramedics race to the scene, details emerge of a couple at war, Kelvin and Asia Newton. Most of his temper seemed to be directed towards Asia. She was the focus for everything. In South Wales, has murder come calling at a family home? One hot, still July morning in summer 2013, Kelvin Newton dropped off his middle daughter Sophia for work and headed towards the home that Sophia shared with her mother and two sisters. On the afternoon of the 14th of July, Kelvin was seen entering the house where Asia was living and he knew that she was on her own in the house because he had just taken Sophia to work. The couple's youngest daughter was on holiday the eldest had recently moved out. The CCTV footage from the neighbour's house shows him going in and then leaving with just an 18-minute gap. Later that night, the first signs for Sophia Newton. Something was wrong. My dad dropped me to work and my mum was supposed to be picking me up at 10 o'clock and she wasn't there, which wasn't like her. So I tried ringing her, there was no answer. So I rang my older sister. She answered the phone and said that she couldn't get hold of her either. Nobody could get any contact from Asia and everybody became very concerned about it. Sophia and her sister went together to the family home where they were unable to get in. In the end, we said we're going to have to ring the police because we couldn't get through. Meanwhile, on a lonely side street in Bridgend, a pedestrian noticed a car parked up, lights on, a man inside, Kelvin Newton. Kelvin was in an industrial estate, having made an attempt upon his own life. The attempt seems to have been a serious one. He had taken 40 tablets and he had slit his own wrists. Shocked, the passerby asked, what could they do? They've just come across a man who's, who needs, needs help and that he's harmed himself, he's taken an overdose and they're going to ring the police or they're going to ring an ambulance because he's vulnerable and he needs help. As Kelvin was stabilised in hospital and prepped for surgery on the severed nerves and tendons in his wrist, police had arrived at the Newton family home where Sophia and her older sister waited, their trepidation growing. We thought that she might have just fallen asleep and she hadn't sort of realised the time or whatever. But then as time went on and we were sort of banging the door and there was still no sign, there was, we thought that maybe some, she could have like harmed herself in some way. They would discover the truth was much worse. The police arrived and they managed to get in through the door, so they went upstairs. We followed them upstairs and then they turned round to the top of the stairs and said that she was there and we had to go out because it was um, a crime scene. What had happened behind these closed doors? In what neighbours thought was a perfect family home, what was the truth of the marriage of Mr and Mrs Newton? When Kelvin Newton first met Asia Lynn Salomon, he had little experience of a loving family life. He hasn't had one of the best upbringings. He came from a home where he had parents who would frequently drink. There was a history of violence within his own family home. Kelvin's daughter Sophia witnessed the impact of his troubled childhood. Dad had suffered from mental health since a very young age and used to take um, like loads of different medication for depression um, uh, and these psychotics and stuff. As a young man, he fell foul of the law, serving time in jail. 
at quite a young age. He started to use violence to solve his problems, you know, as the people were around him. And I just think it was a language he was comfortable with and, and something that just carried on in his life. Asia and Kelvin had known each other briefly at school before parting ways and meeting again a couple of years later. Asia and Kelvin met at the local rugby club. Asia was a single mum. Her life was set up quite well. She was quite happy. She was financially supported by her parents. She had somewhere to live. It was 1988. Asia and Kelvin were both just 19 years old. Calvin wasn't phased by the idea of dating a single mother. In fact, he jumped at the chance to be a family with Asia and her son, Daniel. They moved in together and they got married. A big white wedding at the local golf club. Within a couple of years, they, they were having their own child. Things did move quite quickly for them. In the first few years of the 90s, the young couple worked hard to create the perfect life for their growing family. Kelvin had his own business. My dad used to do um, building work and he was really su successful. He'd done quite a few like celebrities sort of um, around the areas working on their houses. Before long, he was working on a home for his own family and initially things went well. They found a house up for auction that, that needed some work and it seemed like the perfect home for them because Kelvin could then use his building skills, build a proper family home for them. They pretty much knocked most of it down, so like just it was the shell and then he built everything like to make her into a house then. The couple's firstborn was a daughter. Two more baby girls followed in quick succession. Kelvin and Asia were able to give their children all the things they themselves had never had. The family owned quite a lot of land in Pencoid um, and some horses. We used to go um, on holiday at least, like abroad at least once a year. Um, we used to go on like day trips, as a, like all of us as a family. Anybody from the outside looking in would have thought that he had learned so much from what he didn't have as a child and had turned it into something uh, that, was a, that was just a privileged life for his children and for his wife. We were always aware of the um, ta like happy times that we used to have and how lucky we were for having them to like family times and the places we used to go and stuff. An idyllic home life and a couple who were prominent members of the local community as Bridgend native Beth Edwards, now a national news journalist, remembers. Just your sort of normal, salt of the earth, local family, really. You definitely see Kelvin more in the community than you would Asia, whether it was through his job as a builder or whether it was tending to the horses on his dad's farm or whether it was in his role as kit man with the local rugby club. Rugby was Calvin's passion, one he shared with two of his four children. Daniel and Sophia seemed to enjoy rugby and sport like their dad. When my brother was younger, he played for Penko Rugby Club. So my dad took up coaching and um, done his coaching through college. Me and my sister, there was only 10 months between us. So when I was little, my mum used to always be with Samira. And then because I was that little bit older, I'd always be with my dad. So he used to take me to rugby. We used to go and like, out the garden, passing the rugby ball. Kelvin even signs up to be the kit man at the local rugby club, which takes up, I think, about three evenings of a week. A huge, huge commitment. This role would include things like making sure every member of the team had their kit ready for match day. And then he would also be responsible for equipment, so things like the rugby balls and cones for training and, and things like that. Both of us used to love going down there. With rugby, it's the best community you can get because you feel like a family and everyone's there to sort of support you and look out for you. The club was at the centre of social life for half of the family, at least. I can't remember an occasion where we would have seen Asia and the other two daughters, Charmaine and Samira, at the rugby. In fact, unlike her husband, Kelvin, Asia's face was not well known in the area. 
Helvin didn't like her venturing too far from the family home. Asia had a number of part-time jobs in local shops and so forth, but they were never full-time jobs. She would be in one job and then that would end abruptly. No steady job, rarely seen out socially. Was this by accident or design? An early sign, perhaps, of a controlling husband. Kelvin would do things that prohibited her from being able to get to her job, wouldn't give her lifts back and forth, wouldn't pick her up, would make her late. And so she never seemed to find a job that she could stay in for very long. Asia's life appeared to be constrained by Kelvin's idea of how she should live. You sometimes see in relationships like this where the men are abusive and controlling. They don't want their partners to have any financial freedom. They don't want them to have a job. They don't want them to have decision-making responsibilities or anything like that. They want to keep their lives as small as possible, keep control of them, and not allow them to have, you know, like a broad, interesting life. For a while, Asia abided by the rules Kelvin set for her life. But then something happened that shattered whatever fragile stability Mr and Mrs Newton had arrived at. Daniel fell from a moving vehicle and received very, very serious injuries. As soon as my dad used to drink, he used to turn nasty, everything up, and then he turned to the bottom of a bottom of a bottle. Without a steady job, Asia was essentially a stay-at-home mum to her four children. It was a role she appeared good at. Mum used to be amazing. She always used to make, like, um, Christmas. It would be like a massive um, family get-together. She couldn't do enough for any of us. If we were struggling with anything, she'd always be there. Emotionally, she'd, like, always make, take us to our appointments, take us to doctor's appointments and stuff. We were always... We were lucky like that. Asia's role as a homemaker was also something that suited her husband. She was looking after the children, so that, that also fulfilled a need in Kelvin probably to be the provider, to be the father. This is, this is his identity. To the outsider, Kelvin appears to be, you know, this... He's a provider, he's a good person, he has good relationships, he's got a good business that's going well, it's successful, he works with a rugby club, he's taken on Asia's child from a previous relationship. So therefore, it, you know, it looks, he's portrayed as a positive member of the community. Dr Jessica Taylor, a forensic psychologist, believes it wasn't just about Kelvin restricting Asia's access to money by getting in the way of any part-time jobs. It was also about restricting her access to the support of colleagues who knew her well. If they don't spend any time around her, you, you don't get a feel for if she's OK. She's not able to disclose to anyone. She's not able to build any trust in relationships where somebody is able to then say, are you OK? Is everything OK in your relationship? Because you don't seem OK. I don't see you around anymore and things like that. It would appear that the controlling nature of the marriage was there from day one. But did anyone at the time notice trouble in the Newton marriage? Some incidents were hard to explain. Asia had turned up one day in, in the local community with a, a shaved head. She had told people that she had done it for charity, when in actual fact, Kelvin had shaved her head as a punishment for something that she had um, done wrong in his eyes. That isn't a violence that is going to be over in five minutes. That violence she's going to have to carry around with her until her hair grows back. She's going to be humiliated, ashamed. It's so very cruel and is an extremely effective control mechanism. He wants to keep her inside the house, under his control. Kelvin's ability to control his wife began to crumble around the 4th of May, a Sunday in 2008. On a stormy overcast night, tragedy struck the Newtons. May 2008 was a real turning point for this family. My brother went up to Bristol on a night out. Daniel Salomon, 21 years old, who had recently become a father for the second time, 
Later on that night, we were all in the house and there was a knock on the door from a neighbour. He said that he wanted to speak to my mum and dad, called them in the porch and said that um, Daniel had been involved in an accident in Bristol. Daniel had travelled from Pencoed to Bristol in a minibus with his friends. They'd come to the traffic lights ready to go, go and um, someone shouted, our oh, boys were here, so my brother went to get up at the back and fell out of the, back, the fire exit door at the back and a car hit him in mid-flight. Daniel fell from a moving vehicle and received very, very serious injuries. He was taken to the hospital and he was actually on life support. Asia, Kelvin and their daughters drove to Bristol, an hour away. They pulled us into a room with a liaison officer and told us that um, he'd been in a road traffic accident. He, um, they were clearing him, his like, body bled and stuff up. And then my mum and dad had to go and identify him to make sure it was him. And um, then they were putting him in into intensive care. We were just all taking her in turns to go in to see him. My um, nan and auntie and that come up then the next day um, and everything was just sort of, we weren't really sure what, if it was going to take a turn for the worst, if he was going to get better. But within two days, they had to make the decision to turn off Daniel's life support. The family gathered to say goodbye to Daniel. They called us all in and said they were turning the life support off. We were only allowed about 10, 15 minutes with him before they had to take him down to surgery because he was donating his organs. For a few weeks, shock and the practicalities of dealing with Daniel's death kept Asia and Kelvin busy. It was just numb, everything. You just didn't feel, didn't feel right. Asia took the decision to donate his organs. And as a grieving mum, it seemed to me that she took a lot of pride and comfort from the fact that her son was able to live on in helping other people. And Asia did some press interviews. There was a sense that she was struggling and wasn't afraid to admit that she was struggling with the loss of her son. Whereas Kelvin had gone to ground somewhat in terms of keeping it to himself and being stoic in his grief and internalising a lot of it. The community rallied around. The news of Daniel's death hit Bridgend really hard and the nature of his death was a real tragedy. And it's the type of thing that people were talking about for weeks and months after it had happened. So it really impacted the community. And the thing is with Bridgend, the rugby club is the heart of the community. And Daniel had been involved in both Bridgend Rugby Club and he'd also played for his local team in Pencoid. So you had a, a rugby community that came together to grieve and support Kelvin and Asia and, and the three girls. Once the shock of Daniel's death had receded, Asia and Kelvin were left to cope with their grief. It was very soon clear that both were struggling. Daniel's death had a, a profound impact on the entire family. It was as if from that day on that my mum had sort of passed away slightly as well, like she was never the same person as um, she was beforehand. Everything just sort of crumbled from there on, really, as a family. Asia went into a deep depression. She withdrew from the world. I think that Asia prided herself on being a good mum, as best a mum as she could be, and she lived for her children. And I think the death of her only son gave her one less piece of hope in life. She'd spend hours down the grave, like making sure it was clean, cutting the grass down there. She used to spend like hours on end, even at like nine o'clock in the night and stuff, she'd stay down there. Grief for Kelvin Newton took a different complexion. Kelvin, throughout this time, had still been suffering from mental health issues. He had them under control. He had previously been a heavy drinker. He had that under control. He hadn't touched a drop for 10 years. That all changed. The mental health issues became far more severe. He became a heavy drinker again. He would regularly drink 
10 pints of very strong beer and he was unable to control his mental health issues when he was under the influence of alcohol. You could tell with my dad when he was sort of gonna, when he was getting nastier and nastier and the more bottles were going down, the more you could see it in him that he was gonna change and snap. When Calvin snapped, the whole family knew about it. He would smash objects and smash windows and punch doors and kick doors. His moving between depression and, and almost mania or, or severe anger started to dominate the girls' lives. They became very frightened of him and his temper tantrums became very violent and they remember him throwing things. Could be a cup one time, but could be a microwave or a television another time. But the main target of Kelvin's temper was not his daughters, it was his wife. Most of his temper seemed to be directed towards Asia. She was the focus for everything. Some of it was subtle. It would be controlling elements, like putting um, a voice app on Asia's phone. So if she got a text message or a voice call, it would read out the person's name who was sending it or calling. Kelvin would always know who was calling and who Asia was in conversation with. After Daniel's death, Kelvin began to feel that Asia was slipping out of his control. Things had changed between Asia and Kelvin. They had almost what you might call an agreement of how, how they behaved towards each other. I mean, this wasn't a written agreement, this was a marriage agreement. So Asia behaved in a certain way, Kelvin behaved in a certain way, and as long as nobody upset that balance, everything carried along nicely. When Asia became depressed, she did not respond to Kelvin in the way that she had previously done. He then starts to lose control over her, and the violence escalates, the control escalates at that point. And when Asia failed to toe the line, the consequences could be dire. Burns, cuts, scrapes, little micro-violence that could be hidden quite easily, but which seemed to be quite degrading and humiliating. And yet, outside the home, Kelvin was still the upstanding citizen, the reliable builder, the capable kit man. To the untrained eye, he wasn't an imposing man. He, he wasn't, you know, the, the life and soul of the party. He wasn't verbose. He was quite quiet and unassuming. But unfortunately, I think that was a lot of why it went unseen for so long, was because he, you know, didn't cut your typical figure of a, a violent, abusive man. That's not necessarily uncommon, where you have this almost Jekyll and Hyde type character, where you've got this positive portrayal outside the home and something very, very different inside the home. But as Kelvin's drinking increased, so did his violence, until it reached the point where Asia Newton had had enough. Asia had been in contact with Mohammed, the waiter. He started to flirt with her and she was very flattered. One day in 2011, Kelvin Newton committed an act of aggression against his wife, Asia that could not be hidden or ignored. Things really came to a head when Kelvin set fire to the couch in the house. He was arguing with my mum over drink, and my mum went to take the can out of his hand, and then the, the can spilt on the, um, on the pillow, and then he lit it then, and he went up. Me and my young sister ran out of the house. My mum had run out, and then he'd stayed in the house, um, put out the fire, and locked herself in. The police were called, he was arrested, and I think Asia used that window of opportunity. He wasn't there, the police were in control. She had some support to get a restraining order against him. That was a big, big step for her to take, and probably a very frightening step as well. But with the courts and the police involved, he did move out of the family home. It wasn't long before Asia allowed Kelvin back home, though. 
where the angry outbursts remained a regular feature of family life. On one occasion, he poured petrol down the stairs. On another, he was arrested again, this time for threatening with an axe. There would be periods where it was worse, and then times where Calvin seemed to be more in control, but that there could be small triggers that would lead him on a spiral of weeks and months of abuse. He set fire to sofa, he wielded an axe, and that's extremely serious, very, very dangerous, and it's exactly what we would see as a red flag for someone who's gonna go on to kill their partner. Perhaps Asia realized the threat that her husband posed to her life. Finally, after 23 years of marriage to Kelvin, she decided she'd had enough. She delivered an ultimatum. It was either us, like, as a family, or um, the drink. He didn't reply, so she said, I'll give you time to think about it. Strangely, not what we'd expect to see, he took the decision to not sober up. He left the family home. He went to live with his sister. It seemed a turning point in the story of Mr and Mrs Newton. Mum was sort of happier, my dad was happier. They were still speaking and still in contact. The peaceful period was not to last. Kelvin had no intention of giving up his wife that easily. When Kelvin moved out, he only partially moved out, really, because he still considered this was his home and this was his family. He was always up every day. He used to come to the house to let the dogs out and see to the dogs and stuff. And then um, if, like, we needed lifts or anything, he'd do all that. Kelvin would still come to the family home every single day by 8 a.m. He had a key, so he would let himself in. He would make himself uh, food and drinks. He would make Asia a cup of tea every morning and take it into her bedroom so he still had access to her private spaces. Dad was paying for the mortgage and for food. Mum couldn't afford it because she was still on benefits at the time. It's not clear that Asia welcomes the daily visits. He's got control from a distance in that way, but that relationship is estranged, but he's still able to just waltz in whenever he wants, and who's going to do anything about it? Because he's going to argue, I'm paying the mortgage, it's my house. So he still has control over significant factors in Asia and the children's lives, which is a roof over their head, food, finances, things like that. He was inserting himself into their lives in a way that um, he could without the police being called or being censured. While Asia had wanted a separation, she wasn't really free of him at all for any period of time. If Asia or the girls wanted anything, they had to go to Kelvin for it. He, in turn, seemed to take pleasure from displaying his generosity. Kelvin liked to look after his family as he saw it, and he liked to have these big, extravagant gestures to show what you know, a wonderful and loving father he was. On my birthday, Dad paid for me and my mum to go away. We went out to Tunisia, um, me, my mum and my nan. Unfortunately, that was a decision that he would live to regret because on that holiday, Asi met another man. When we were out there, there was um, a waiter that was in the um, food court and then um, he got chatting to us. The waiter was a terrible flirt. It turned out that Asia had gone for coffee with him. He started to flirt with her and she was very flattered. This was fun for her. There was no control of her. Kelvin was back in Wales, so she probably relaxed a bit. Back in Wales a few days later, Asia immediately told her daughters she needed another holiday. Asia had maintained contact with Mohammed through the internet and emails and chatting online and had decided to go back out there. She was going to book to go back out on her own to sort her head out and then come back and have a fresh start. And when she was there, the waiter man was there. They were in contact then while she was over there. I think she was just blinded by the fact that she was getting this attention that she hadn't had for years and was hoping that something was going to happen. Like this sort of miracle sort of thing and this relationship that she's always wanted. Asia was extremely happy to have a friend. 
and somebody that had shown her affection, light-hearted friendship and hope and optimism that she was an attractive woman, that she was desirable and that somebody could be attracted to her. Central to Kelvin's success in early family life had been his ability to provide. His money showed his success. Now he was about to see his hard-earned money given to another man. He could only speak to her in internet cafes over there, so he asked her for um, a laptop so they could speak when he was at home and stuff. He was manipulating her and flattering her. The household did start to suffer, and it wasn't long before Kelvin found out. Kelvin was furious. It's an interesting reaction that he has because he reacts almost in a way of he's betrayed, but obviously because he's abusing her and he has control of her, what he's not seeing is that he's using the money in the first place to control her. They've been estranged for 18 months. The only reason there's still money going into that house is because it's part of the power and the control over her. To Calvin Newton, this was the ultimate betrayal, one that he was determined to avenge. Once he saw her with another man, that was it for him, and that is when everything became absolutely catastrophic. July 14th, 2013, police find Asia Newton lying lifeless on her bedroom floor. They'd said that it looked like she'd passed away and they had to ring um, for an ambulance to come. Initially, the police thought that this was a suicide. Uh, there were no real injuries to Assie apart from the injury that had killed her. A red totten dog lead was wrapped around the mother of four's neck and mouth. As officers assessed the scene, they began to notice clues that suggested Assia may not have done this to herself. We had to have interviews because we, I was the last person who seen my mum and my dad. I said, um, where's my mum's car that my dad had borrowed to take me to work? Um, and that was, still wasn't at the house. When they searched for Assie's car, they found Kelvin. It was then that Kelvin made the admission that something had happened at the property. And one of the things that he said when he was found was that he did not mean to kill Assie. Kelvin went in, and we can only imagine what kind of an argument blew up between them. The subject matter is almost inevitably going to be his wife's decision to move on, his wife's decision that their marriage was over. Kelvin would later tell a court that his former wife had been goading him. Kelvin claimed to the police afterwards that he had got into an argument with Asia, and he used a really, really common defence that you see a lot of these kind of humiliated men use, and that was they were having an argument about Ahmed, and she was comparing Kelvin to Ahmed unfavourably. What Kelvin told the jury is that in the course of his visit to the home, Assi had decided to taunt him. She taunted him about his mental health issues. She taunted him about his lack of sexual prowess in comparison to Mohammed, the Tunisian waiter. In response, according to Kelvin, he simply snapped. He told the jury that he took that dog lead and he was trying to wrap it around Assi's mouth. He was telling them, I was trying to gag her. He claimed that everything he did was an attempt to gag her. He would claim that he shut his eyes and pulled on the two ends of the lead until Asia slumped to the floor. Calvin maintained that he had never meant to end Asia's life on that day, that he had not been able to control himself, and before he knew it, she was lifeless and that he had strangled her to death. Was this really what had happened? Knowing how long Calvin Newton spent in the house that day, criminologist Jane Mungden Smith is skeptical about his version of events. Within that 18 minutes, Kelvin had strangled Asia with a dog lead. He had showered himself, changed his clothes, tidied up, cleaned, gathered some of the forensic evidence, and then calmly left the house. The short time frame, all of the things that he did to try and cover up what he had done, strongly suggest that he had actually planned what he was going to do. 
Could this really have been an argument that escalated? The murder must have happened very, very quickly after him arriving, or he wouldn't have had time to do the other things he needed to do. If they had got into a fight, say, that got out of hand, and he had attacked her, um, maybe meant to kill her, but not planned it in advance to kill her, he probably would have been in a bit more shock. He probably would have been concerned about what he had done and not have it fixed in his mind the things he needed to do to forensically clean himself and separate himself from what had happened. There's not a doubt in my mind that, that Kelvin planned to kill Asia. What of Kelvin's attempted suicide? He did take 40 tablets. He did need to have his stomach pumped. He did cut his own wrists. He did seem to be making a fairly concerted effort. None of this was enough to actually kill him. I think the reality for Kelvin of actually killing himself was maybe too difficult, maybe a bit more effort than he thought it would take, and maybe he just didn't really have the kind of um, belief that he wanted to do it after he'd solved the problem of Asia. Once that problem was solved, a lot of the anger and tension would have gone. Once patched up, Kelvin was forced to face up to what he'd done. Kelvin's attempt on his own life was unsuccessful, and as you'd expect, he was arrested and he was charged with Assey's murder. At Cardiff Crown Court seven months later, Kelvin Newton took the stand to plead not guilty to murder. He admitted killing Assia, but argued that he'd lost control provocation had caused him to act the way he had. This was manslaughter. His defence said that he had undiagnosed health conditions and that it was more than likely that he suffered from bipolar and other personality disorders. What's more, Kelvin's defence team suggested he couldn't help being the kind of husband and father that he was. Kelvin said that he came from a home where he had parents who would frequently drink and that there was um, a history of violence within his own family home with his own parents. He was painted very much by his defence as a victim of abuse himself and that this cycle had unfortunately continued but that it was out of his control because he had been conditioned to believe that this is just the way that a family is run. This is the way that a husband treats a wife. He told the jury that he'd always hoped to get back together with Asia and had been heartbroken to discover she'd met someone new. Asia had shared with him that she was going to um, Tunisia and that she was hopeful for a friendship. She had begged Kelvin to let her move on. And she had a diary which had this written down, words to that effect, please let me go. Would the jury believe that, taken together, the mental health and the heartbreak and Asia's alleged goading, Kelvin had simply been pushed over the edge? Perhaps they would, but investigating officers had discovered a notebook kept by the victim over many years, which detailed countless times that Kelvin had attacked his wife. It emerged that in the course of their marriage, he tried to drown Essie. He tried to strangle her on another occasion. He had beaten her. You've got so many very serious acts of violence that could, she could have died on any of these. So the, it's not out of the blue, this behavior, that he then strangles her and kills her with a dog lead. He has shown over and over again that he is capable of it. On the 27th of February, after a two week trial, the jury was ready to return their verdict. Calvin Newton was found guilty of murdering his wife. Two weeks later, Sophia Newton sat alone in court to hear her father's punishment. Sophia had, and still has, mixed emotions about the fate of the father, a father she still loves. They said 18 years, but to me, justice will never be done until my dad passes away because he's taken my mum's life. On sentencing, Judge O'Leary Reese sentenced Calvin to 18 years in prison, so he will be eligible for parole in 2031. She said that this was a callous murder born out of sexual jealousy for which his defence was not 
to be believed that he had been provoked, that he had inflicted years of abuse upon Asia, and sadly and inevitably, this had led to her death. As Kelvin Newton serves out his time, his family are left on the outside, dealing with the fallout of his crimes. Everybody's a loser here. There's no winners here. Um, a family that seems to have had a history of tragedy and a mum that now can't be there for her remaining daughters and grandchildren. A man sitting in prison having to live with what he's done. I ended up contacting my dad then and saying, you're the only person I've got, but if I change my mind like from now or later years down the future that I don't want contact with you, you're going to have to accept that. It's, it's just tragic. It's just tragic. And, um, yeah, there really are no winners in this case.